Welcome back to Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Scott Fira. Scott is the author of the recent book, Dead Companies Walking. He spent the last 30 years in the financial services industry, and since 1990, he's managed the hedge fund Crown Capital. His fund has significantly outperformed the S&P 500 by investing in fast-growing companies while also shorting the stocks of dead companies walking. Scott holds a BA from Stanford and an MBA from Northwestern. Let's ask him five good questions. Welcome back, everyone. My guest today is Scott Fearon, who's the author of Dead Companies Walking. Scott, where are we chatting with you today? Well, I'm uh, at uh, the offices of Peppercom, which is a public relations firm on uh, Park Avenue and 34th Street in Manhattan. Excellent. Now, Scott, let's uh, let's jump into our five good questions. The first question for you. What's this? What's in your book? You talk about historical myopia and in the context of super cycles. Could you give us a little background about that? I found that part interesting. Uh, yes. As you know, I wrote the book, Dead Companies Walking, which came out on January 6th. Palgrave's the publisher. But I just literally go chapter to chapter. I have five chapters where I talk about strategic blunders made by managements that have led to company bankruptcies. And for me, the very first company I tried to analyze was a oil uh, field driller, an oil service driller called Global Marine in Houston, where I was working at the time for the largest bank in Texas uh, in 1984. And I met with management at their offices. They were very confident that you know the oil business then was going through just another one of the many down cycles because the price of oil had dropped uh, 20, 30%. And uh, they were convinced that when utilization of their rig fleet, they had 20 offshore rigs at the time, every time it dropped into the 70% range, that that always meant buy the stock because the utilization rate would pop back higher in the next two to three years. What the management there didn't realize, but I as a relatively young, fresh-faced investment person didn't realize, was that while the commodity prices have throughout the decades gone through these two, three year, three year cycles, including the price of oil, every 30 to 50 years, there was a massive uh, up or down cycle that uh, would just swamp all the many cycles that occurred in the few years prior. In this case, the commodity in the mid 80s went from almost $40 a barrel all the way down to $8 a barrel. And service companies that had too much debt, many of them went bankrupt. And in this situation, Global Marine, which was a $6 stock when I met with the chief financial officer within 18 months, it too had filed bankruptcy. And that left a real powerful impression on me. And so fast forward to 2008, 2009, nobody in America in 2007 thought that home prices could drop 30% across all markets, across all price points. But it did, and it didn't just do it in 08 and 09 for the first time. It did the same thing in the Great Depression. Home prices dropped almost 50% in, across just about every major metropolitan area in America in the Great Depression. And yet, nobody, lenders, home buyers, investors, thought that could ever happen again. Well, it almost did, and it almost wiped out our entire financial system in the so-called Great Recession of 2008, 2009. So, um, so People basically, need to be students of history is all I'm saying. And unfortunately, many management teams and an awful lot of investors are not. And they're just not looking back far enough to, to see right. the, the real, the real right. cycle, which could be longer than, than the last couple cycles. It's human nature to assume that what's happened in the prior five to ten years is what will happen in the next five to ten years. And while that's usually true, there are also periods where we'll enter – huge super cycles up or down that we may not have seen, say, for 50 years. Right. So that's that's a good segue to question two. And uh, just out of, sounds like, career circumstance, you happen to be at ground zero of some of the biggest bubbles, um, you know, in relatively recent history. 1980s, uh, you were in Houston for that, that bubble and oil popping, and then living in the Bay Area in the 1990s and or late 90s. So as these things were happening around you, what were your thoughts at the time being uh, so close to the action? In 1980, uh, 1990, uh, well, actually 1980, 19, excuse me, not 1990, about 1980, uh, 
1988, I moved back to the Bay Area from Houston, and I, uh, I had actually lived in the Bay Area a decade prior when I went to Stanford University. But uh, I moved back to the Bay Area, and Shazam, I started, I ran a mutual fund, and I started my hedge fund, and I was right there when the uh, dot-com bubble started heating up, and I visited many of the dot-com companies in the late 90s. And it was, by all accounts, the greatest bubble in financial market history. The Wall Street Journal even wrote an article where they tried to quantify that fact, and they did. What was it like? It was amazing. I mean, companies were being funded by VCs on nothing more than a, a literally a 20-page business plan. Many of these companies got funding right on plans written by students at the Stanford Business School. The vast majority of these companies failed, and they failed because... Again, people thought that trees would grow to the sky and the money was everywhere. And it's interesting. The way up took about five to eight years. The way down took about a year and a half. And that's the thing that's so fascinating about bubbles. They, take, they can take up to a decade to build. And when they burst, they burst quickly and they, and the, they take no prisoners on the way down. Uh, and, of course, I physically had visited companies like Quokka.com, companies like Woman.com. Companies like Planet Rx, which did uh, use the internet to do home delivery of, of prescription med medicines. And every single one of these companies, either literally within a year and a half of me being in their offices, filed bankruptcy or came very close to it. The stocks all went below a dollar. And it was just eye opening to see this otherwise bastion of highly educated people believing what was turned out to be utter BS. Huh. So <clears throat> question number three goes to your – I think maybe your secret sauce as an investor is that you've been willing to go out in the field and actually visit with all of these managers, which is kind of a – I think that was more common you know, many, many, many years ago. But I think you know, with the advent of the internet and data is readily available, there's almost no reason to leave your, your study anymore. You can get all the numbers of the business. But – so you visited with something like 1,700 – uh, managements, let's say, which is an incredible number. Um, one of the things, questions I had that was that uh, is that I would be if I was uh, evaluating doing it myself that way would be I know that managers to get where they are have to be good salespeople. That's just part of the job of to get become a CEO of a public company. How do you counteract their influence as a good salesperson? Uh, when you're evaluating the information that they give you when you visit with them? Well, start with of the uh, over 1,500 company headquarters I've been to, the vast majority of the time I meet with the chief financial officer. Uh, uh, far less often do I meet with the chief executive officer, but I try to meet with both. And every time I go to a company to meet with the chief financial officer, and maybe if I'm lucky, the chief executive officer, I ask very simple questions like, Hey, who are your customers and how are they faring? Hey, who are your competitors and how stiff is the competition in your industry? Companies like, I ask another, I always try to find out what their capital allocation plans are in terms of if the company ever generates significant profits, will they return it to shareholders in the form of dividends or buybacks, or maybe they'll go out and make acquisitions. Uh, I also then try to ask and get answers to what the company's profit agenda or targets are. And yes, you're correct. A lot of people who get to the level of CFO or CEO of a company of any size of significance, they're pretty smart and they're pretty optimistic and they're pretty self-confident. But you want to be certain that they're not people who are not just trying to sell you, but they're selling themselves. And, not that you, and we ask questions about what's the gross margin target? What's the operating margin target? What's the EBITDA target? They better have answers. Hey, I don't care what the answer is. They just better have one right. to say, oh, you know, we're going to grow, grow, and grow because this is an open-ended business and an open-ended industry. That's not a good answer. And so you do have to be cautious. You do have to be careful when you're interviewing a senior management in their offices. But when you go there and spend an hour and a half, you learn an awful lot more than you do by just reading the 10Q, the 10K, or uh, a press release. Uh, you wouldn't. You, you're going to invest your own money in a, in a money management firm and in a money manager. You're going to feel more comfortable if you meet that money manager face to face and if you just read his canned comments. And the same is true when you invest in individual companies. 
And so that's why I like to visit, and that's why I like to get a, a better understanding of the uh, senior management's ability to navigate the industry in which they're operating. <clears throat> so question number four is, what do you look for in a good short candidate? Two things. Revenues, if they have them, that are shrinking or growing at a uh, decelerating rate on a year-over-year -year basis. And if you marry that to a, any sort of level of debt where the company needs to generate some amount of cash flow to service that debt, meaning they need to generate cash flow to make interest and or principal payments, well, if you have revenue shrinking uh, or growing uh, uh, at a decelerating rate, and of course, debt never shrinks <laughs> unless you pay it down, <laughs> you can pretty quickly conclude that, hey, this company could get to a point in the foreseeable future where they can't make interest and or principal payments, and that's what leads to corporate bankruptcies. Now, uniquely enough, the one part of the country where you don't see a lot of debts in Silicon Valley, but those companies just simply run out of cash. And... So anyway, those two factors are the two most important ones of all, which is revenues that are either shrinking or growing at a decelerating rate. And, you, and when that's married to a debt level of some significance, you can kind of guess that bankruptcy is a possibility. Um, so basically like a, a lot of dynamite and a burning fuse. Yeah, you betcha. That's, I think, as well put as, as, as any. So... Question number five, and this was actually one of my favorite parts of the book because it's a message that I'm maybe I'm pers you know projecting a little bit for myself here, but it's this idea of the that failure is not a bad thing necessarily. These companies, you know, in a capitalist system, when they fail, we're hopefully leaving an even stronger system when that happens. Um, and then you go into the moral hazards of of the bailouts that we had here, you know, five years ago or so. Uh, what you know? Why do you why do you think that failure is so important? And and maybe you could just reiterate a little bit of the message that you you had there because I I really enjoyed that part. Well, uh, failure in corporate America is more common than people realize. It's not something the financial press writes about uh, a lot because the word failure I've been told doesn't sell books and doesn't sell magazines and doesn't sell newspapers. <laughs> um, but the reality is, is years ago a famous economist described. Capitalism is a process of creative destruction. And I believe that was Joseph Schumpeter. Yep. And creative destruction in the sense that you want people trying to start businesses. You want entrepreneurs that are trying to start businesses. But, hey, most new businesses won't make it. And you, as a society or an economy, we shouldn't be trying to prop up, trying to protect companies that have a failed idea or a failed balance sheet. Instead, we should... Uh, give them a, a great uh, environment where they might be entrepreneurial, but if the idea is a bad one or the balance sheet's a bad one, it's okay. And in fact, it's even good for everyone else in society if that person goes bankrupt, like Radio Shack's bankruptcy just a month ago. This is in the best interest of all Americans, and it's actually as painful as it might be, it's in the best interest of the employees at Radio Shack. They need to move on to new endeavors where there's more, there are things are more productive and more likely to lead to long-term growth for not just a, a, the next company they go to, but for the U.S. economy. And I think it's it might be the number one reason why America's economy has grown so rapidly for so long is that unlike Asia or Europe, we don't protect, we don't bail out our worst managed companies. And that gets us around to what occurred in 2008, which, hey, I have tremendous respect for the intelligence of the people who were trying to navigate that mess back then, specifically Ben Bernanke, the chairman, uh, Paulson, who was the head of the Treasury at the time, who was the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, and uh, Timothy Geithner, who came out of the New York Fed. Uh, you know, they inherited a mess, but I am not a fan of how they basically took taxpayer money and socialized and saved the worst run financials in this country. I think. We'll never know what would have happened had we allowed the natural process of bankruptcy to clean and clear the system. But I just have to believe we'd be growing much faster today had we nationalized Bank of America and Citibank and had we um, basically allowed the, st the stockholders and the bondholders as well of our failed financials to take their hits and let better managed companies take their market share. Classic example is Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo should be the largest bank by every metric right now in this country, 
because they didn't make the stupid, you know, subprime loans. They didn't buy pools of crappy mortgages like Bank of America and B of A, excuse me, the Bank of America and Citibank. But, you know, Wells Fargo was forced to participate in the bailouts by the people running the show. And I think that's awful. I think bankruptcy cleanses and resets the system and lets us grow rapidly. And if you want to see what happens when you bail out poorly managed companies, go look at Japan's economy right now. They haven't grown in 20 plus years. Yeah, no, I think my, I think the favorite analogy that I've yeah. I've heard for that is the the idea of it um, like a, a tree grove that the undergrowth builds up and it needs to be burned out to keep all the the rest the whole ecosystem healthy. Yeah, you don't want an economy or a society where a bunch of large poorly run companies are constantly being propped up with taxpayer money, or you know, which is funneled to those companies through the government. It just is, it's a growth killer. It's a productivity killer. It's, it's an awful idea. And yet, for some reason, and this is interesting, nobody says, oh, let's bail out a failed company in Silicon Valley. They just fail. Nobody says, oh, let's bail out a troubled exploration company in Houston. They just fail. Yet, for some reason, the companies that disproportionately are headquartered here in the Manhattan area, when they get in trouble, oh, we got to bail them out. <laughs> now, you know, we do have FDIC insurance for our commercial banks, and most insurance products are guaranteed protected by a variety of laws and regulations. It's just impossible. I just, I just can't stand hearing about how bailing out AIG was in the best interest of America. I just cannot believe it was. The life insurance side would have been protected, um, and the rest of AIG should have been just taken into bankruptcy court. And the commons, the stockholders should have lost everything, and the owners of the public debt of AIG should have taken a huge 50 to 80% haircut. And then, the, unfortunately, that didn't occur. Right. So, Scott, with uh, every interview that we do, we close it with asking for a book recommendation. Um, and typically, this is something that is one that is uh, potentially underfollowed or, you know, something a little more obscure, not your typical. You know, the one that everyone's heard of. What What do you have for us today? Okay, I read an awful lot of books about the financial services industry because I'm intellectually curious, uh, which is the most important criteria for success, I believe, in any endeavor. I'll give you two. You're going to get a lot of, let me give you two. In the financial <laughs> services space, Charles Ferguson's book, Creditor Nation, came out about two years ago. He's the same individual who uh, put together the documentary um, Inside Job that won Best documentary, I think, three years ago. Yeah. So that's on the financial services space. But if people are sick and tired of books about the bailouts, and maybe we should be, uh, in terms of, uh, I'm a big nonfiction guy. I still think that John Krakauer, I've read all of his books. I think his book, Under the Banner of Heaven, is the most riveting, thought-provoking, and enjoyable book I've probably ever read. So Krakauer became famous when he wrote the book uh, Into the Wild, which is, was made into a great movie. He became super famous with a book called Into Thin Air about hiking Mount Everest. Right. His third book about the Mormon church, Under the Banner of Heaven, is an unbelievable book. And so that would be my second recommendation. Wow, I'm curious to check that one out. I just have read a, <clears throat> it was a Ed Vister's book about him, him hiking all of the uh, the 14 tallest peaks, and uh, I thought it was just an incredible read. Just that what's whole it called? Um, <clears throat> what's it called? Uh, no, 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 yeah, no shortcuts to the top is the name of the book. Okay, um, I'll read it. Yeah, it was I'm really sure. interesting. He's it sounds like a really interesting guy, but yeah, Crack Hours uh, also great. I'm gonna I'll have to add that one. So, Scott, we really appreciate your time and for coming on the show and answering five good questions. Okay, well, thank you. All right, take care. Thanks.